it's not just you. I hate the AWS Web UI myself and the Azure Web UI and the Google Cloud Web UI. But here's a question. These are all multi-million dollar companies, right? Can they not have a decent Web UI for their cloud services? Why do they all have to suck? I mean, AWS recently launched their new Web UI, Revamped, and their UI now sucks in a revamped way. This is a problem for somebody who's trying to learn these services. First of all, you're dealing with like 10 billion services and types of solutions for each of these cloud providers. And their UI makes things so difficult that you go there and wonder, where do I start? How can I even begin to comprehend this craziness? And even worse, sometimes you create these resources and then come back and wonder, wait, what did I configure for this thing? Did I change this dropdown value or leave it as default? Well, I'm happy to say that I have just the right solution for you. Just don't use their UI. Seriously, write code instead. In this video, we'll explain to you what exactly infrastructure as code or IAC is. And a really cool solution that has helped me to successfully ditch all of these web UIs, not just one cloud provider, but the web UIs for all the cloud providers that I deal with. And if you're planning to start learning something like AWS or Azure, this is the way to get started. So let me explain. Okay, I'll be honest. I don't think these UIs are bad because people aren't trying. These are really smart people working on these things and they have done a good job considering the situation in my opinion. The fact is these cloud services are so complex that it's hard to build a UI that's intuitive for all the flows. A bit of an oversimplification alert, but in my experience, it's easier to build a UI when you know what that flow is, right? Designing for a specific flow is easy. But with these cloud provider solutions, you can use these components to build so many things that it's hard to build a good UI flow. So that's why people use infrastructure as code. As you can guess by the name, it's basically code that you write to build, to manage, and to tail down infrastructure. Instead of clicking buttons and scrolling and such to provision like an EC2 instance, you just write code to build, manage, and tear down infrastructure, right? Infrastructure as code. Okay, I know what you're thinking. You know, great, more code for me to learn and write and maintain. Well, as bad as these UIs are, they're still manageable. Should I really be coding this whole thing? Well, let's say that you're working on AWS and you need to create one EC2 instance and uh, let's say three S3 buckets, right? If you don't know what exactly an EC2 instance or an S3 buckets are, don't worry, it doesn't matter for this discussion, just a bunch of infrastructure items for you to create, okay? Now, how do you go about creating them all? So let's say you go to the AWS UI, you know, poking and prodding and scrolling and struggling, and then you set up everything in the UI. Then your manager comes to you and says, nice work setting up our QA environment. Now do all this all over again for prod. Well, you can guess. So as you can see, the benefits of infrastructure as code is not just not having to deal with bad web UI. One immediate benefit you can see is that you have repeatable infrastructure. You can have a set of configuration that you apply for one environment and reuse that for building the exact same configuration, the exact same infrastructure in a different environment. You won't have what's referred to as configuration drift, where you have different environments which are supposed to be similar, but because of some changes that you did in one and you forgot to do in another, the configuration now begins to drift apart between those two environments. This doesn't happen in infrastructure as code. There are other advantages. The obvious one is that you're automating this whole process of building infrastructure rather than clicking around and using manual steps to configure your infrastructure in the web UI, you're writing code and automating this whole process. You also have the ability to integrate this with the CI CD pipeline. So you have multiple people working on this code base, which is infrastructure as code. And when something is checked in, you can have a build pipeline run and actually provision the infrastructure for you. And it becomes a part of the build process. And uh, the other benefit of having it be in the code is that you have the ability to leverage everything that Git provides for your application code base and use that same thing for your infrastructure code base as well. So for example, infrastructure changes can be basically a pull request to your infrastructure as code code base. And you get the same benefits of code reviews and other related visibility advantages, auditing advantages. You can see previous versions. You can revert to previous versions of your code. You can always go back in time and see what the previous infrastructure was. It almost acts like a documentation source of what your infrastructure is supposed to be. Okay. Let's not use the UI. 
you can write code that makes these calls to AWS APIs to create these resources. That, that way it becomes repeatable, right? So first you create, let's say you create a method that creates an EC2 instance, and then this method that creates an S3 bucket, then the pseudocode creates one EC2 instance and three S3 buckets. Now, this is infrastructure as code, right? I guess technically it is, but with most infrastructure as code platforms, you don't write code like this, right? You write code in a declarative style. It's not just a different way of writing the syntax. It's actually a different way of even thinking about infrastructure code. Let me give you an analogy. Let's say your roommate or your friend is uh, going shopping and you want them to get you some groceries, right? So let's say some apples, some spinach, and some ground coffee. Now, how do you communicate this to your friend? Do you say, well, okay, buddy, go to the store, go to the grocery store, pick up a shopping cart, walk to the groceries aisle, pick an apple from the fruits aisle, put it in the cart, pick another apple? No, you don't do that. At least I hope. What you do is you give your friend a shopping list. You don't tell your friend the steps to get the items. You just tell them what the items are, right? The items that you need. This is declarative style of coding. The difference is that with the declarative style, you specify the expected final state and not the individual steps. So your infrastructure as code for some basic infrastructure resources would be a representation of your infrastructure shopping list, right? Like one EC2 instance, three S3 buckets, and so on. Isn't this so much easier than coding these steps imperatively? Of course, there is one drawback. As easy as it is to just write a shopping list, you need a friend who's going to go to the store and shops those items for you. So if you write a shopping list for your infrastructure items, who's going to go and provision those resources in the cloud? But the good news is this pattern is so popular that almost all major cloud providers have a way for you to write infrastructure as code in this kind of a declarative fashion. And uh, they have a tool which kind of makes that happen. So for example, AWS is something called Cloud Formation. Azure is something called Resource Manager. GCP has something called Deployment Manager. They all do something similar, right? You write infrastructure as code in a declarative fashion using that corresponding declarative syntax for the tool that you're using. And then you run the tool and that tool calls the right APIs and makes the things in your list happen. Now you're going, wait a minute, I need to use different syntax for each cloud provider. Well, if you're working with multiple cloud providers, there's a better alternative. There's something called Terraform. Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool that works with all of these popular cloud provider platforms. And it's also open source. It uses this language called HCL, HashiCorp Configuration Language, to define resources for all of these cloud providers. And uh, you run Terraform on that language file, all right? It's a common language, so you just need to learn one and you have a consistent language and tooling workflow that you can use for all these cloud providers. So you can have one file which contains an AWS resource and an Azure resource and a GCP resource and run Terraform on that file and it is going to make sure it's going to call the right corresponding cloud provider APIs and provision those resources for you. So for example, here is a code for configuring an EC2 instance on AWS using Terraform and here is a code for setting up an Azure virtual machine using Terraform. It's truncated for simplicity, of course. And as you can see, the properties here are different because each cloud provider probably expects its own unique set of configuration values to provision a resource. And most often you wouldn't remember this all, right? You, when you're working with Terraform, most of the times what you do is copy paste the definition from the documentation and then tweak these values to what you need. But the benefit is, A, the overall structure is the same, and B, you can have code for multiple cloud providers in the same file, right? bunch of Azure resources, bunch of AWS resources, all set up in the same code. And Terraform is responsible for creating the right resource with the right provider. Like if you're giving your friend a shopping list and saying, hey, I need some spinach and I need some office supplies, your friend knows to go to the grocery store to get the spinach and go to the office supply store to get your office supplies. Similarly, Terraform knows if you're provisioning an EC2 instance, it knows to go to uh, AWS. And if you're provisioning Azure, it knows to go to Azure. So Terraform has this concept of providers, which are kind of like plugins that get downloaded before you run your code. So these providers know how to call the right APIs for the right configuration, and uh, it just makes it happen. So if you're provisioning like an EC2 instance on AWS, Terraform downloads the AWS provider, and that provider knows to call the AWS APIs, similarly for Azure. 
I don't know about you, but there's something about seeing all this configuration for one resource as properties together in one place. It just clicks in my mind. So instead of clicking around multiple pages and scrolling and all that stuff, you see all this configuration items in one place in the core in a JSON-like structure. It makes configuring and even learning about cloud services so much easier. Now, this itself is awesome, but what makes it even better is a concept called state. Typically, when you're provisioning resources, you already know how many resources you need. So let's say you need five EC2 instances for your app. That's all you need, right? So if you run your infrastructure as code again, does it create five more EC2 instances? What if you forgot that you ran the code earlier and you run once more? Do you end up with duplicate resources? Now, let's take this analogy of your friend shopping for you, right? Instead of a shopping list, let's say what you have is a recipe list, okay? So you plan to make smoothies and you need five apples and a bunch of spinach. So instead of telling your friend, hey, go get me five apples and a bunch of spinach, what you're saying is, hey, make sure that we have five apples and a bunch of spinach at home, right? There's a little bit of a difference here. So what would your friend do when you ask them to do this? First, they just, they wouldn't go and shop directly. First, they would look at your fridge to see how many apples and how much spinach you already had. So if you already have five apples and a bunch of spinach, your friend is gonna go, okay, I don't have to do anything. No trip to the store needed. But suppose your friend looks at the fridge and he finds two apples and a bunch of spinach. What do they do? They only need to get three apples from the store, right? Because what you need for your recipe is five apples and a bunch of spinach. So this is a fundamental concept with most declarative infrastructure as code tools. Yes, you declare your resources instead of imperatively creating them and writing code to create them. But these tools also remember what they have created for you. So if you were to make a change to your code and run this tool again, what it does is it kind of figures out what the delta is, right? It does the work to make sure that what you have provisioned matches what you have in the code. So for example, if you were to change your Terraform code to update the number of EC2 instances from five to seven, and you run Terraform on that code again, it goes, well, I've already created five EC2 instances, the code says there should be seven EC2 instances, so I gotta go create two more. So similarly, if you remove resources, then uh, you know if you were to change their code and say instead of five, you make it three and run Terraform again, Terraform goes and destroys those instances to make sure the resources on your cloud reflect what you have written in your code. I hope you can see how powerful this is. This results in an interesting property of infrastructure as code processes, which is something called item potency. An item potent operation is an operation that you can perform multiple times and there'll be no changes to the result beyond the first time you ran that operation. Because tools like Terraform or even you know, cloud provider specific tools like cloud formation, they keep track of the resources that you've already created. So you can run it multiple times and it doesn't matter. It only has work to do if you have made a change to your code and what is in your code is different from what's actually provisioned on the cloud provider. All right, so this is infrastructure as code. If you want to work with cloud providers like AWS or Azure, I highly recommend you try on one of these infrastructure as code tools, specifically something like Terraform because it's open source and you can work with multiple cloud providers with just one tool and one workflow. And if you want to learn Terraform, I have a full course for channel members that teaches you everything you need to know about Terraform, all the essential concepts and syntax and how to use it to work with AWS as an example provider. So do check it out.